They'll be calling you a radical. Post Ignorance Chapter 3, the blowjob that changed the world. This is no hypothesis, this is reality. In the 1990s, the United States was becoming rich, very rich. The technology revolution was on, and the United States equity markets were raging in a weighted wealth context, which is all that really counts. The United States was seeing wealth created at an unbelievable rate. Oil, $15 to $20 a barrel. Gold, $260 an ounce. Commodity prices at decades lows. The equity market's up over 40% on an annualized return, including dividends. How rich was this country? Very rich. Individuals as well as companies, small and large, millions upon millions of new jobs being created every year, millions and millions raising for poverty level every year. The welfare numbers falling dramatically. The budget surplus, yes, I said surplus. Now let's not confuse a budget surplus with a surplus in regard to the debt. But in the reality of this, that Reagan, H. Bush years had left a staggering amount of debt. The 1980, the debt was well under one trillion. By 1992, the debt was three trillion. We had supply-side economics at its finest, with the I refuse to pay taxes as the political platform of vogue and reality. I will never forget in the late 90s, President Clinton giving a press conference and using as props some graphs the White House had made up, showing the dramatic decline in the debt. And he said and showed in the press conference by the year 2009, the United States would be debt-free. The technology boom was in full flight, new technology inventions born every day. I was a derivative trader and a semiconductor analyst and arbitrage derivative specialist. I was making money fast, very fast. The individuals' 401ks and retirements were turning the working class into millionaires daily. The exercising of stock shops has been anywhere from the CEO to the janitor were flowing the government via taxes faster than even a politician could spend it. When a stock option and exercise, it is not like the sale of an equity or commodity or real estate. You do not just take care of the taxes on next year's return and roll it into a similar asset to avoid the tax. It is chopped at the top at the point of the sale and goes to the government right at that moment. So the government did not have to partake in tax collection, a very expensive way to collect tax, IRS. The tax load was being covered by the selling and or exercising of stocks options and a full unemployment workforce that was making marginal wages. We cannot forget even in the 1990s, wages in real terms were falling just like they did the decade before and the decade after. 30 years of supply side trickle down on your head, golden showers from the power freaks. But in the 90s, everyone was looking at their individual retirement plan and gaining the sense of security that would soon be preyed on by a starving unicorn. No one could ever expect or receive a second of airtime on the thesis in regard to the fact that real wages were declining because the fact of the said matter was the net worth of the average American was increasing and they were spending it. The greatest cover for the NAFTA fallacy was painted in. The service-based economy term was born and gulped up. The power freaks that devised this sixth piece of legislature were on their first hit of heroin. When the news broke, then the news broke that President Clinton, whose poll ratings were the highest of any president in decades, were, was having sex with a young intern. It was still no big deal. The neocons like Newt and Daly hated him anyway. They were the 20 to 30 percent that hated him no matter what he did. The hair sprayed, I'm gay and I hate being gay, moral far right. There's no doubt in my mind that the far... The very far to the hairspray right are all gay, every last one of them, and they were taught at an early age and ground in that being gay is a death blow and evil and they are going to hell. So they spend their entire life hating and stumping and screaming, I am moral, I am right, I am hetero, right down to having a spouse and children. I met Newt's sisters two years ago while she was campaigning for the Democrats. I went to her speech in Salt Lake. She is openly gay. It was one of the best talks I have ever heard in years. She held no punches and told the Freudian truth. She went anti-Newt big time and talked to the said subject matter I am speaking about right now. Finally someone who spoke my language, Freud. When Newt and Ken Starr, a frustrated, confused sort, went on his grandstand of hate, the country was whatever, who cares in the majority. Look what Kennedy did, everyone said. And just thinking of Clinton's uh, strategist, James Carl's great line, again, Freud, it's the economy, stupid. Then Monica emerged with the, help of one of the, uh, with the help of one of the ugliest females ever seen, inside and out, Linda Tripp. She fit right in with Newt. I would always say it, 
at the time. Newton Miss Tripp, along with Daly, should make a porno so that it could be played at sex anonymous meetings. It would be better than castration and lobotomies combined. Anyone who watched it would never have sex again. But there emerged an issue that I think is in the back of many minds that does not get talked about. She was no Jennifer Flowers or Jessica Hahn. This girl was large and strange. Clinton had sex scandals galore, and everyone, including Hillary, it was heavily, a pun is good once in a while, covered in the 1992 campaign. But Hillary Flowers, and, or Jennifer Flowers and Clinton called them his girls. She was a very attractive, well-endowed female. And men and women alike where I have a certain core respect for anyone who is sleeping with her. I know people are going to say I am sick. I believe it is true. No, not me being sick. That is debatable. I know when I first saw Monica, I was like most everyone else. Wow, Clinton is one of those. You know, the plus size female lover. I have a one-liner I use in regard to this said matter. If you want to know everything about a man, look at the woman or woman or man, or for that matter, he stands or sleeps with. And I do not mean pure physical. I mean integrity. I mean grace. I mean charm. I mean elegance. If you think this is not true, think about the last 12 of 13 first ladies. No offense, Bess. Your mother is to blame. The last presidents in reverse orders. Better halves, Michelle Obama, Laura Bush, Hillary Clinton, Barbara Bush, my second favorite first lady with an incredible wit, Nancy Reagan, Rosalind Carter, Betty Ford, Pat Nixon, anyone who does not know her story should read it. Talk about strength. Lady Bird Johnson, Jackie Kennedy, Mamie Eisenhower, we will skip Bess Truman. That one does not fit this contest. Cuckoo Kachoo, Mrs. Robinson. I said I was starting this study in 1932. My point is the election of the president has much to do with the presence of his wife without even saying much of anything at all in regard to the man's agenda or actions. No female president yet. That will happen in 2016. And no, not Sarah. We as Americans have stereotypical views, and we are pretty good at it in the regarding of poise, grace, charm, elegance, and strength. We are not right all the time, but we use the said deductive reasoning at all times. You could gild it in gold and cast it in concrete, as the great Dr. Cooley would commonly say. At the, as the great Johnny Versace once said, the American female has lost her charm, grace, and elegance. One of my favorite quotes of all time, it was not that Monica was large, she was the type of person that 90% of people just say eek. Not because of her size, as much as the isms I spoke of. She was just kind of creepy. The association with Linda Cripp as her close friend creeped people out, and people could read it on her quickly. One thing Americans are the best in the world is reading small little microphysiological isms. We have to. We start in kindergarten, but necessarily, the United States is a very violent place, and people kill each other. We as school children can read personalities pretty well for the most part. Monica was one of those most of all Americans could read very quickly, right or wrong. It put a cloud on Clinton. And had, a very, and had very little to do with him having sex with her of any kind. Most Americans didn't care. It was the type of female he interacted intimately with. It put a dis disturbing fog to his core. I had a very funny cousin, Bootney everyone called him, Troy Blanche, who was, I was very close with growing up. And as a young adult, he was one of those people that everyone loved. He was one of the cool kids because every, he had confidence to do everything or was crazy, one of the two, probably both. He shaved his head when very long hair was in vogue. I asked him one day, he said, why did you do that? I like feeling the way, I like the feeling when the cheerleaders run their hands over it. He said, he was serious. One day it was, I was 17 and he was 16. He said to me, Kevin, I think there is something the matter with me. I said, we all know that. He said, no, seriously. He was serious, I could tell. I said, what is it? He said, I am attracted to slightly chunky females. I said, Bootney, those are not slightly chunky. The girls you have been hanging with, they are fat, really fat. He said, I know and I like it. My point is this, we all know exactly what he was talking about. We joke about it, we laugh about it, but we understand something is unsettling with it. As Americans, not the psychological, the American psychology, it is like a blotter test. It is not what the artist sees that are intended, it is the human way he sees, or she sees. I believe this unsettled people just a little. So when the so-called lie came out, I did not have sex with that woman. It gained a little more traction. I honestly believe that if he'd said indecent that the blowjob that changed the world was from, let's say, Pamela Anderson type, or Jennifer Flowers, or Jessica Hahn, or Marilyn Monroe look-alike, no one would have cared. Gore would have won.
By so far the greatest theft in nearly 70 years in the world, the greatest theft in American history would not or could not have taken place. Remember, Gore would not let Clinton camp pay with him because of the blowjob from the big girl. If Linda Tripp, was, who was surely jealous, would have not said anything, or if the blowjob would have been with Jennifer Flowers type, Clinton would have campaigned, and Gore would have won by a landslide. Also, do not forget Larry Flynn of The Hustler, who by the way passed away. Now this is where I got a caveat this. I made a mistake. Sorry, Lynn. You're, I know that your uh, reports of your demise are greatly exaggerated. I got him mixed up with Bob from Penthouse. I wonder who has a list. He cut a deal with the Neo Wright. Remember his list? and what supposedly was on the list. He was going to print the list of senators and members of Congress that he had voted to impeach who had been involved in sex scandals. There were fairly credible stories of some pretty disturbing, even by American standards, sex acts did not, not all involve hetero partners or humans for that matter. Think about this. The raunchiest magazine from one of the raunchiest businessmen of our time, popular opinion, not mine, Penthouse, cutting a deal, or excuse me, Hustler, cutting a deal with the moral right. It did happen. That is a fact. So 2000 comes around and let's get started laying out the facts of the subject matter. Remember this book is a study in post ignorance as art and culture in the very serious reality. The above facts are not in jest. They're what they are. The reaction in the neo ignorant that evolved via blowjob with a big girl of and there as the pure selection of the truth when in the consequence of ignorance, the consequences of a cultural of ignorance is something I want to explore the grooming of one popular opinion of who sex is okay with and who it is not. Not in a popular culture manner, the core of the human drive does not habitat in correct language. It is in the young physiological development and contemporizing manner in the time of popular cultural popular opinion. First I will dive into the cause and effect. I just went into the cause, popular opinion, neo-ignorance, how the horrific, very real, ugly effect, I believe to be the counter-reaction in a pure reality, unseen in world history. The rip effect, this is the way, is way too big to use a water metaphor, is like the meteor that killed the dinosaurs, much better metaphor than the ripple. Metaphors are a very real concept of truth. They are an extremely important part of language. As I as to getting the information across in an honest, relevant reality. Again, I believe as a Western United States citizen, I like many Westerns do use language in a very direct fashion. I believe it is the best way. The effect of the blowjob is all that is relevant that the theft of the election is where the first sign of the blowjob shows up in reality. We know the reality was born of the cause. Then so-called morality right was able to recruit just enough delivers that believe morality is the issue and not it's the economy, stupid carvel. I say it, the religion, the re, it's the, I say it's religion, stupid. I was in graduate program and assisting Dr. Madsen at the time of the presidential campaigning and the school television station was doing random interviews and asked who was going to win and why. They interviewed me and I said Gore wins even though the poll showed Bush was a slight three points at lead. I said when people get in the booth, they will vote on their wallet and the economy is extremely strong. I truly believe in my own words, there was no doubt in my mind Gore would win. The girl that interviewed me after the interview said, you are the first person who said Gore would win. I said, how many interviews have you done? About 10 so far. I remember thinking, am I overlooking something that cannot be right on a university campus? Then I thought, oh well, it's Utah. After all, Clinton ran third here, well behind H and Ross. I still thought in a very reasonable context that Gore would win easily, which he did. He won the popular vote by 500,000 votes. He won the Electoral College by a wide margin, 291 to 246. That is the real totals. But there was just enough anti-blowjob middle voters to make Florida close. And Jed was the governor of Florida, so W led his first cousin at Fox, went against all 30 other news outlets, news outlets and said, hold on, we have a chance at thievery. We have five very dug-in elephants in the Supreme Court. If we could get it there, we could pull this off. Then the true gift from the right, far-right gods was presented. Kathleen Harris. God himself must have sent her. Like when W believed God put him in this place at this time for this reason. They both gave speeches saying exactly that. And then there was the two biggest players in the greatest theft in American history, born of very different looks but identical motives, Freudian anger seeking power redemption. Again, as this is true, again, as she truly believed, a gift from God himself, Katherine Harris, and the strangest of the strange, Linda Tripp, 
This is a fact. Talk, think about it for a while. Wow. The greatest crime in American history has been pulled off. The photo of Chief Justice Byers leaving that court the night of the 5-4 scam says it all. Look at the elect college was set up to give states individual power in regard to presidential elections. So the big populous states cannot carry a presidential election. So when the Florida Supreme Court ruled the court the count goes on, they ruled correctly. Remember, the mass media set up at the Florida court, they would wait and wait in a Dorothy brick road looking courtyard and then all of a sudden a person no one had ever seen before would poke his head out of a little window and read a few words then shut the window and be gone. It was one of the very strangest things I could say my mind has ever thought about or seen and my mind thinks about some very strange things. It reminded me then and even more now of when Toto pulled back the curtain. The building even looked like the Emerald City building. It was Art Deco as it gets. It was creepy in the own, its own powers. It was a gigantic metaphor to the truth powers of this country. I had studied and read about the three times in American history that the Electoral College had overruled the popular vote. The most baby boomers had discussed it over a keg or a bong hit or two. John Quincy Adams, 1824. Rutherford Hayes, 1876, and Benjamin Harrison, 1888. I knew that in 1888, when it happened, the country was near rioting, and the road to the White House was blocked. It was waiting for chaos, and it never happened. I, I was waiting for chaos in 2000. It never happened. I could not believe it. it was not until 2006, six years later, I was at Bryant Park in New York City and had bought a hat pin from a vendor at, a, at the fair at the city was having this said, I hated Bush before it was cool. That is when I struck up a conversation with a woman I had bought it from. I told her I could never believe that the reaction to the theft was so tame. She said, I was at the inauguration in 2001, and it was not tame. Security was intense. AIDS and all kinds of things were being flying everywhere. No one could get within hundreds of yards of the route. I said, why did not, I did not see any of that on any of the many, left or right. She said, welcome to the new powers in America. I knew exactly what she was talking about, the neo-ignorance powers at work. After all, I know Karl Rove. I have met him several times. He looks a lot like Lib to Trip. Maybe the anti-porn idea of mine could be updated. He has lived most of his life and been educated in my home, Utah. And no, we are not taking credit for this one. He was born in Denver. They can have that accreditation. I bet the Coloradians love that fact. But I totally understand the mindset. I have lived it. I have worked it. I have loved in it, bred in it. Mark, believe me. I ask myself why every day of my life. The media was as dumb as the drooling Jamestown masses they were feeding, left and right. Remember the free pass all the media gave the warmongers and the theft. The media drank it up more than anyone. Bush Stool's election, September dawn. To all you historians, the Mountain Meta Massacre, check the date. Greenspan's fallacy is empowered. Fox gets legs like a centipede. Murdoch finally has an orgasm. No child left behind makes drooling a teacher teaching giant. Wealth without hard work is king. Buy here, pay here. Loan shark and is a car dealer is legal. White collar crime is legal and encouraged. Exploiters say it is exploited while they exploit. An ancient society of wealth, culture, and art is destroyed. Eisenhower's warning comes true. A contemporary society becomes Orwellian. Hillary votes for the war and loses her place. The middle becomes far right. The far right becomes neo-nuts. The country gets closer to economic and socially broke. The U.S. equity markets lose 80% of its value weighted, which is all that counts and matters. China becomes an economic giant via NAFTA. Religion takes over the United States, turns into 1770, jolly old England. The name George becomes a very real metaphor in history books written in 2040. All this made possible by a strange, overly ambitious, chubby chick and a very ugly middle-aged woman. The blowjob needs no metaphors. It says it all like a, like a straight-up says it all like straight up like a shot of 10 high in the morning. I used one anyway. I watched with total amazement every hairsprayed hamburger eating fat fake religious scammer in America go to work. They were let out of their basement and given a big shot of Balco. I know there it is again. You will see it again. I was getting ready to start my own hedge fund. I had made a small fortune as a freelance derivative trader and arbitrage derivative specialist. I was in the middle of a very ugly divorce with an attorney who had voted for Pat Buchanan in the 2000 election, who had married the youngest girl of, of a family of wealth, married money, and was a devout Mormon. 
who I later found out was addicted to pain pills and faked his own illness, telling everyone he had brain cancer, including me. For real, Stan the Scam. And accidentally, on purpose, forgot to file several motions in my re behalf. I had the backing of one of the number one business schools in the United States and the backing of three funds on Wall Street. I had worked for I had worked for. I had a very strong reputation as a fund manager. I set up raising money for the fund. I wanted a local investor base. One of the biggest mistakes of my life, my old boss offered me $3 million from his fund, and I turned it down because I wanted to benefit my home, Ogden and my people, Ogdenites. I wanted to do this on my own. My old boss had been retired for years now. He still loves me and supports me emotionally and will tell everyone about me. He has been a great friend over the all the madness. I wish he would have never left Wall Street. He was old school, full of integrity. When he left in 2001, he told me, mark my words, Kevin, Wall Street is headed down the wrong road, and asked me if I had watched W's economic summit at the Crawford Ranch. I told him I had, and I was appalled. He said, W has no clue. The wealth of Wall Street will pay, play him like a rag doll. I said then, and I say now, that is when Wall Street and the CEOs of the country were told mousing numbers are not only legal, now but encouraged. He said bingo dingo, which is a phrase I love to use while trading derivatives in the 90s. Every time I made a big score, I would yell across the trading platform, bingo dingo. He named me lost boy of the street. Remember that I choked on a pretzel, black eye? I would tell one, you know what the real story was, no pretzel, it was a punch. Remember Laura Bush's mother, W's mother-in-law, got burned big time in the Enron scam, which by the way, W's close friend, a financial supporter, Kenneth Lay. Remember Kenneth Lay's wife's Good Morning America interview? Miss Lay, something in the context that we have had so much hardship. We have had to sell two of our seven homes, the one in Vail and the one in Palm Springs. That is how denested these freaks can become. Remember Kenneth Lay and the others tripped their friends off of the upcoming investigation and plainly told them to sell their stock. Of course, I'm sure they bought puts in the derivatives market plain down and made fortunes. Well, I believe there was a confrontation. You remember this is when W called his economic summit. Remember his secretary, the Neanderthal Lucky Snow. Wow, was that a scary. Ken Lay's scam was a big part of the summit and the reason for the summit. W had called together CEOs. I believe W jumped some people's ass in regard to letting, not letting him know of the upcoming Enron investigation. His mother-in-law and probably himself lost a lot of money in that meltdown. Remember, when a president becomes president, he puts his holdings in a blind trust, a Sarah Palin wink and a nod special. He got, it, he got into it with someone and got knocked out by whoever he confronted. Just a hypothesis of mine, just a guess. You look at the black eye in that punch to the face. Black eyes as I have ever seen. And I have had my share given and taken. I do live in Ogden, Utah, as rough as a city as you will find anywhere. One day we were at the coffee shop right next to the New York Stock Exchange. My boss, Anthony, was standing in the coffee shop. There were a bunch of young suits. I would call them standing there. He saw me walking by and waved me in. He knew that I he knew that I could set up court like no other. I do at the track, I do on Stralton. He knew I would give them all they asked for. One day at the coffee, one day at the office, one of the senior traders told the boss, Kevin is nothing but a western hick. He did not know I was standing right behind him. I said nothing. My boss said, Yes, you are right. But that is one educated hick who has outtraded you three years in a row. Anyway, back to the coffee shop. I walked in, and the girl who worked there in the coffee shop, Jenny, who I knew well, very well. Well, I knew a lot of girls in those days. Remember, I was fairly rich, young, and successful then. She said, Kevin, they want to hear your accent. My boss said, Kevin, tell them where you and what you do on the weekends. One of the young suits, Princeton guys. Daddy boys, big time, said, are you really from Wyoming? Which I am not. I am born and raised in Utah, but spend a lot of time where I'm because of the pure fact I love to gamble on racehorses and is the closest places I can go to is Wyoming. Remember, the Mormons don't gamble, right? So I played along like I was always doing the Big Apple to this day and said, yeah. He said, do you have, do you have roads out there? I said, hell no, we don't have roads. Remember, this is a Princeton MBA and it's not joking. I went on, did Jenny or Tony tell you what we do on the weekends out there? 
They all said in symphony, no, what? I knew Jenny and Tony had teed them up. I said, we ride our horses to the bar, hang around, drink drinking whiskey until we get a few guys wound up enough. Then we go shoot Indians. One of them says, no shit, you shoot Indians? I said, yeah, I got six of them last weekend. I heard one of them say, Tony is right, this guy is crazy. Of course, I made every part of it up except for the drinking whiskey part. In those bars in Wyoming, girls shoot whiskey and chew tobacco. The cute girls, that is no bullshit. I had a very sexy, cute girlfriend in Wyoming, not that long crew, who I said to her one day, real Wyoming girls chew tobacco. This girl was as girly as it gets. She said, oh yeah, you think I can't? Give me that can. I have chewed for years off and on. Quitting tobacco is easy. I know I've done it thousands of times, Mark Twain. So she put it in a big wad and it stayed there for hours. So the rough part is very real. After that day, we all hung in what I tell everyone is the greatest strip club in a strip club, American bar none in those days. It is still there. Wall Streeters in the 90s all hung out there after work. After that day, I never paid for a drink once ever. They would yell, Lost Boy, come sit with us. But my point is, I had a very good reputation and track record for years. I was still am and a very hard worker. At the same time, that I was trying to raise money for my new fund, a very odd duck named Val Southwick was raising money for his fund. I knew very little about him, but I did know he had hired students that I had helped teach. And he would always pick the nose up your ass types, who I had very little respect for. He, he was invited by our business dean, Mike, great dean, to speak at the school. Mike asked me if I would like to attend. So I did within minutes, I knew he was a total fraud. It was not the hairspray or the strange grin. It was his words, he claimed to be a hedge fund. In Utah, the community, that was like saying I can do the Delta formula in my head, which I was very good at at the time. It was very foreign language to most Utahns. So no one had a clue what he was talking about, nor did he. So I raised my hand and asked him, which derivative market are you hedging in? There are only a few in the US. He looked at me and answered like the skunk in the headlights. He was a fraud, and he knew I knew. After that meeting, he avoided me like swine flu. I got him to the, I got into the luncheon, and he said, Kevin, I am a real estate fund. I said, a REIT? How are you hedging? And how do you know my name? He said, yes, a REIT. Hedge fund? I used to date your cousin in high school. I knew that he was either lying or it was the very, very short, shortest date in history. She is a very sophisticated, beautiful woman now and was then. So I just moved on and did nothing much about it. As time went on, I raised $36,000 when I knew I had to raise at least one million, so no fun. I went to work managing two private people's money with very good returns over the next couple years. I had recommended they buy Philip Morris MO for the dividend yield and they got lucky and the equity itself doubled the less than two years. I had, re I had recommended it for the dividend yield and I had rolled puts underneath for insurance. Then in 2004, I got a call to come look at a concrete repair job. I still had my Blanche plastering business. I started in 1983, 10,000 jobs. I went to the job. The secretary had called for bid. She said, Val, we'll be here in a few minutes. Can you hold, can you wait? He did not know who he had, she had called. He arrived flying up in a copper-covered sports car. He got out with gloves on in the summer. Anytime you see any man with gloves on in the summer who is not a construction worker, we know, we all know, kind of like the blowjob from a large girl, we know. He jumped out and started talking about he started talking before he noticed it was me. I can honestly say I've only seen one man in my entire life's hair stand up with an entire can of hairspray on it with no wind. He literally ran into the building to get a so-called phone call. He was not getting away from me that easy. I quickly scratched out a bit and was right behind him. Val, do you need this bit or not? He acted like he could not hear me and locked his office door. His secretary said, leave it with me. I looked over and there was one of the biggest Loser nose up every professor's ass students I had ever known. I knew I could trick this old brown noser easily. He knew when he was in my class I would have never passed him, but the school did not let me grade. I was an athlete when I was young, a very good wrestler. I had always known when you were overly ambitious, 
competition, athletics, or business, you simply let them over-leverage themselves. They will always pin.